Welcome to the Academic Woman Amplified Podcast. I'm your host, Kathy Mazak, tenured full professor, mom of three, and firm believer that the culture of academia needs to change radically. Women are revolutionizing academia within institutions that were not built for us. If you're ready to reject the culture of overwork, kick guilt and overwhelm to the curb, and amplify your voice to make a real impact on your field without breaking down or burning out, you're in the right place. In the summer season of the podcast, we're busting the myth of the quote unquote traditional path through academia by featuring the life stories of diverse academic women who have created success for themselves on their terms. Get ready to get inspired. Let's go. Today, I am super excited to introduce you to our guest, Dr. Rocio Caballero Gil. She is one of our very own writing coaches. She is one of the wonderful coaches who helps us with our programs here. She is right now serving as the program lead on Momentum, and she works in all of our programs. And she has such an interesting story. It's a story of an immigrant who comes from Peru to the U.S. as a young person and manages to navigate the U.S. higher ed system and become a geoscientist. As she does that, the path is not linear. It's not direct. It's not smooth. And all the things that she learned in her quote-unquote non-traditional path, we are definitely putting that term in question marks or in quotation marks and questioning it, Everything that she learned inspired her to take action and create a professional organization called Geo Latinas. You're going to hear all about it and how Geo Latinas is developing to support Latinas in geosciences around the world in this episode with our coach, Rocio Caballero Gil. Hello, I'm so excited to talk to you. Okay, will you please introduce yourself? Tell us your name, your pronouns, your field of study, and what you're doing now. Okay, hi, my name is, I'll tell you my long name, Rocio Paola Caballero Gil. Uh, You can just call me Rocio. (laughs) My pronouns are she, her, hers. And my field of study is geology, but specifically paleoclimatology and paleoceanography. And right now, what I'm doing right now, right? (laughs) I'm kind of in a transition period. (laughs) So I've been working in academia as a researcher for a few years, but now I'm transitioning to focus my time and energy to working as a writing coach and also to further develop an organization that I recently co-founded called Geo Latinas. Yay! Yes. So you heard right. Rocio is one of the wonderful writing coaches here in our business. So I'm super excited to talk to you. And we're going to start at the very beginning. So I want to know, what were you like as a little girl? (laughs) The very beginning. (laughs) So I actually have to think about this. (laughs) I have a a, a group chat with my mom and my sister and I ask them, okay, what was I like a kid? (laughs) Kind of like prompt me. And it's funny because it was almost like a similar answer. I think as a child, I was very curious, but to the point that I was many times getting in trouble. Um, yeah, like, you know, like little, you know, like little sassy girl, mischievous girl. But but also I was it was funny because I was also seen as a responsible child. So more often than not, every time we had like gatherings with kids, other family members, I was the one in charge from the grown up perspective, what to do and where to lead them and this and that. So yeah. I was getting in trouble, but still being seen as the responsible one. Mm-hmm. In terms of school, I was kind of like a geeky school girl, like really wanted to get all the best grades because, you know, that's what I was told I needed to do. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But I was also a social butterfly and constantly looking for ways to do, even even in primary school, to do volunteer work and help like other little kids that didn't have opportunities that I had. And, you know, even like older people, because grownups were scary, but older people and kids were more comfortable. (laughs) So that's where I did my work. (laughs) Yeah. And so, so that was 
you know, all through, I went to school in Peru. So I, I see school as primary and secondary. Mm-hmm. So when I think of a child, the CEO, it's, it's mostly primary. Mm-hmm. But when I asked my family, they all said, yeah, you were sweet, intelligent, and sassy. And I'm like, great. <laughs> that sounds just like what I thought. Yeah, and you um, still are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do have to say, as I thought about, okay, well, what about later? As a teenager, I was even more of a rebellious person. Mm-hmm. So I know, you know, I grew in this curious little person grew up to be so curious, but also more like wanting to disrupt things and change things. And, and so it was funny because my mom, at some point, I remember her saying, cause I got in trouble for something that I did at the university or I guess it was high school. And she goes, yeah, I don't know this girl. She's either going to go to a convent and help others, or she's going to join the guerrilla. And I don't know which one's going to be, <laughs> but she's going to, she's going to do something like that, <laughs> like help somebody in some really specific way like that. Very extreme, mom. Very extreme. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. So tell me like a little bit more about high school. Like, did you know you were going to go to college? Like, what were you thinking as a high schooler in terms of more education? So I grew up in Peru. And from my parents' perspective, even though, even though my mom was very into education and mm-hmm. she was like, oh, this is what you do. You just go to school. Um, my dad was, he didn't go to the university and he was more of the freedom, you know, like do what you love kind of person. Mm -hmm. So in my head, I had to go to the university because that's what what my mama said. But I also knew that I I had to find what I really, really loved and how I wanted to make my way in the world from my dad's side as well. Yeah. So to me, it was more like I have to go to use it as a tool to be able to do the things that I love. Mm -hmm. through that. So there was no question. I I had to go. And then the question was like, okay, to do what and where and how, because the systems are different in Peru from here. So. Yeah, absolutely. So how did you figure out like what to study and where? So it it was kind of like the choices that I had (laughs) were limited. (laughs) So I knew I liked science from all through high school in different aspects of it. And, and most of them had to do with life and the chemistry of things and then the environment. And so through my years at the high school level, I zoomed into more of the environment thing. But I also, I went to um, a French school in Peru, a French private oh, school. Uh-huh. And so, yeah, so I never learned English until, you know, I had to. <laughs> That's amazing, yeah. <laughs> and so I loved languages. And so I was like, okay, but I really, really like languages. So I was like, is there a way that I can combine something environment and languages? And I was like, yeah, it's not going to work. So I was like, okay, fine. I'm just going to learn forever in life. I'm going to be a learner for life. Mm-hmm. And so I figure I'm going to go to school for something environment. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to learn languages through the whole, whole, my whole life. And so when it came to that, I was like, okay, now what universities in Peru and Lima, because I wasn't going anywhere, but in the city where I was, where can I study anything environment? And there were two universities at the time that could potentially help me do that. One was the, like the agrarian uh, agronomist university. And the Mm -hmm. other one was more, it was a good choice, but it was so much more male dominated than the other one. And I was like, I'm not going to that one. (laughs) I want the other one that seems more green and it has its own, you know, ways to grow food and make yogurt. I was like, I'm going there. Mm -hmm. So that's where I went. But the universities in Peru were different from here, at least at the time when I was still odd, but when I was going to the university, you had to take an exam that was so long and so comprehensive. It was, Uh you know, it wasn't an SAT or GRE. It was all the subjects you could ever imagine, all the main Mm -hmm. subjects, it took four hours. They were only, at this university, I remember it was 300 spots available for people to get in Uh and 3,000 people applying. Oh my god! And people would apply over and over. And so to me, it was like, I know where I want to go because my my choices are limited. I know what I want to do, but if I don't get in, it's like, okay. So I had to get in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I got in and I was like, <laughs> yes, you know, it's, it's great. Uh, and then within a week of getting in and getting the results, because you get the results almost immediately. Uh-huh. I ha- we had an interview at the U.S. Embassy with my parents. And that's when we heard, okay, you're going to go to the U.S. And I was like, what? <laughs> but I just beat all those. I beat th- 2,700 people for a spot at this university. No. Wow. No, so I, yeah. So I, I was very upset. I got to do one semester and then we went to the U.S. Wow. So and then you didn't speak English. You spoke French and Spanish. 
Yeah. So because I liked languages, I mm-hmm. started learning a little bit of English, okay. but it was my focus was French because mm-hmm. I really, really loved French and uh-huh. I still do. But I was like, well, you know, environmental engineering, because that was my major at the time. Mm-hmm. I had to somehow learn some English and I knew eventually it was going to be a requirement. So I started taking classes on the weekends. And of course, I was a teenager, so I would skip some classes. <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> I wanted to go to the beach. I wanted to go out. Yeah. So I learned the verb to be. And <laughs> and then I watched movies in English because I wanted to learn. So by the time I got to the U.S., I knew the verb to be, various ways to conjugate things because of my French background. Mm-hmm. And oh, my God, from the, you know, the little movie of the, the little kid that stays at home. <laughs> home alone. Oh, there the you go. Alone movie. Oh yeah. I know all the expressions from that. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. So you basically, you're doing the thing that you're supposed to do, that mom says you're supposed to do, right? Like get the degree, you got into the good university, and then uprooted and moved to the States. Where in the States did you move to? Yeah, we went to a place, actually where I live now, but at the time, so many years ago, it was a place that had, there was no public transportation, If you wanted to go somewhere, you had to walk maybe a couple miles because, you know, we didn't have a car either. And there was a McDonald's gas station and maybe a giant. And that was it. Wow. So we went to a place that to me, it was like, okay, I I went from this big city, Lima, with the one career that I know I love. I can use to change the world to do not speak the language. You don't have a car to go around. (sighs) Yeah, it was pretty traumatic. It took a while to get used to it. And so... And I didn't know the education system in the U.S., so Mm -hmm. it was even more scary. And, you know, you hear people talking about you get a loan and you go study and you move away. And I'm like, okay, I'm Peruvian. I am not going to move away. That's it. Right, right. Get a loan. You mean like thousands and thousands of money? I was like, no, no way. Like, it's like heard of. No, I'm going to be living to pay for that. No way. So in my head, my choices were you got to go somewhere to learn the language and be able to continue studying. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be fast and it's going to be time efficient and also financially efficient. Mm -hmm. So I, because I came in when I was under 18, I was able to go back to high school. I did four years of high school into uh, two. Mm -hmm. I learned English and then I went to the community college. And once I got to the community college, it was like, okay, now I can do this. And I was like, no, you can't because first of all, you really have to work so you can have a car and get to there. Yeah. To study. And then you only have, at the time, they only had biology, chemistry, and geology as the majors. And I was like, where's environmental engineering? I don't know. And, you know, <laughs> right. <laughs> And I, and I was, a, you know, I, I was a non-native. I'm, still not, I'm a non-native. So I was like, okay, I think theology is the closest to being what I wanted to do originally. Mm-hmm. So that's how I got into geology. And then I took a class and I fell in love with like the fossils and the rocks and the processes and just looking at the earth from a different perspective. And I was like, sold. So, nice. so that's how I got into geology. Yeah. And then it was another story trying to figure out what to do from there. <laughs> Yeah. Well, so let's talk a little bit about like the difference between you having like your mom who was like, you weren't first generation. You had your mom to say like, this is what it is to go to the university. You knew what the universities were. You knew how to get there physically. Like you knew it. And then to go to the U.S., how did you like the idea of going back to high school and then community college and then whatever you did from there, which we'll talk about in a minute, like, did you have any mentors or anybody helping you navigate that transition period? (laughs) Sort of. So first, even though my mom was, she was versed in the university and the Mm -hmm. college and all that, when I came to the U.S., that meant nothing because yeah, she exactly, knew the right. system there. And so I still struggle with the idea of first generation because I feel like I'm a first generation, yeah. but mm-hmm. I know my mom had a degree in Peru. Mm-hmm. So the expectations are different from that side, but the I have no clue what I'm doing. It's and, and who to ask, yeah, or no, knowing somebody that, who, who has that cultural capital, right? Yeah. That, yeah. No. Yeah. And, <laughs> And I relied on my ESL teachers. There was one person, Miss Aranka Duke, and she was amazing. And she really, really, she was invested in all the students. And so she, she wasn't a geologist, but she knew some geologists. And she's like, oh, mm-hmm. this is what you have to do. But even though I trusted her and I liked her a lot and I knew she, she was looking out for me, just hearing you have to go to this one school in some other state. It was just too scary for me. And I was yeah. like, I don't, I'm not ready for that. Like I'm, I'm a little Peruvian here. I want to be with my family. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. 
I had mentors who, you know, I see her as one my first mentor in the U.S. basically. And even though I got that guidance, it just wasn't the time for me to say, I'm going somewhere for yeah. this career. I didn't want to put my career in that sense as the center. Mm-hmm. I wanted to put my family at the center and then see how the career could fit there. Yeah. And so that's how I ended up with community college and all the next steps. Yeah. So what were the next steps? So you found geology. Yay! Then how did you go from community college geology into the next step? So the community college that I went to in Northern Virginia had a connection with one main four-year university. And so to Mm -hmm. me, it was, okay, that's the one I have to go to. Because otherwise, Mm -hmm. I would have to either drive too much, and that was a really sink of time, or go somewhere in the state, but farther away. And again, to me, I think... Uh, mostly always guided my decisions based on what I know I want at the center, which is my family. Yeah. And so I was like, I can only go around, you know, within this radius. <laughs> so it was community college and then that one university. And when I got to that university, I was still lucky because at the time they didn't really have many professors in geology. I think that I had like three people that mm-hmm. I knew maybe in that department. So it was a very small department, not really the place to go for geology, but they were good. And one of them who was very new came new and fresh faculty. And he was like, oh, we have to do research. And I'm like, what is that word? Uh-huh. <laughs> how, do you, how do you eat that? What is that? Yeah. And, so, <laughs> and so because of him, I was like, yeah, I'll, you know, you know, curious little girl, I'll do whatever. Let's, mm-hmm. let's do this research thing you talk about. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so I went around uh, Virginia, jumping around from wet- wetland to the next and, and figuring out if I wanted to work with this kind of setting and what kinds of things I could do. And, you know, I did my first presentation at a conference through that. And and I love the whole process of it. The thing that I was researching, it wasn't what I really was passionate about. So I was like, okay, I know I love this. Now I just have to find the thing to use it right. for. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And so and because it was a commuter school, 45 minutes away from DC, you have a lot of uh, adjuncts and faculty members or affiliates who work in other places. And I was lucky to connect with someone who worked at the USGS, the United States Geological Survey. Mm-hmm. And that's when I was like, OK, that connection, what I learned from that person and, and the people that you know he worked with, that defined my next steps in the career, what I was going to research, how I was going to do it, where I was going to do it. So. So that's another way that you kind of like just making these kind of steps towards like closer and closer to more geology research, which is super exciting. So did you do an internship for the USGS or how did you work? What did you do for them or with them? Yeah, so it was funny because I ended up doing first a student worker, you know, appointment. And but it was only because, you know, Rocio didn't know much about the education system. And so naturally... (laughs) She thought <laughs> she could just sign up for classes and do this and that, go to the advisor. They tell you what classes to take. Well, the, somehow there was a miscommunication there and they failed to tell me I needed to take this one class that there was only offered like every other year on one semester. Oh. And I was like, I'm going to graduate. I'm going to go to the Peace Corps. I'm going to save the world and the environment. Uh-huh. And then I didn't have the class. And I was like, oh, I can't graduate when I wanted to. I can't. And of course, it, it was mostly white males advising and so yeah. this white male goes it's not a it's not a competition for CEO you you'll get there eventually and I'm like you mean two years later I'm like the clock's ticking I want to have a family like I'm like hello oh my god <laughs> so, yeah I know it, it was that was one of my first feminists and I was like okay really <laughs> you don't get it <laughs> so I look I looked for ways to not have to wait for that long yeah. And one of them was an independent study, if I could find somebody to do it with. And then I met this person, Harry Dowson, and I was able to do that with him. And so working with him for this one credit to not have to wait two years to graduate, yeah. that's how I got into, oh, we work together. This is interesting. This is what I want to do. Let's do a student work appointment. Mm-hmm. And then that became um, a contractor. Mm-hmm. You know, once I was taking less classes because I was closer to graduation, then I graduated. So I was, I guess I was still a contractor, but I was a you know right. worker for them. Mm-hmm. Maybe yes, I was. Yeah, I forget the, the, the term, but I was working with them still mm-hmm. until I went to grad school almost mm-hmm. within like days. <laughs> within <laughs> so, days? <laughs> yeah. I've, I've always worked a lot. And so, you know, it's it, no surprise that I didn't even take 
to lace off <laughs> between, <laughs> between your job and grad school. So like, yeah. how did you know that you wanted to go to grad school? Like, did you know always that that was like more study, more study, more study was going to be the way that you went? In a way, because, you know, I knew from little that I, I wanted to be a learner for life. I was going to just always learn. And I mm-hmm. felt like grad school was a way to do it. My mom, <laughs> of course, she was like, every time that she had in her mind, like, oh, of course, you're going to the university. I don't think she, well, I know she never really thought it was for geology or anything like that. And it was always a question of what are you going to do with that? What kind of money are you going to make? Like, is this even a job, career, anything for a woman? <laughs> Like what? And I was like, I'll make it. And she's like, uh, no, <laughs> are you sure? And I was like, yeah, I'll find a way. <laughs> so in my head, it was for me to continue learning, for me to be able to do what I wanted. And once I met this one person from the USGS, Harry, mm-hmm. I knew when I grew up, I wanted to do what he did. Uh-huh. And he had a PhD and I was like, okay, I'm going to get a PhD. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I don't know how, I don't know what that even spells, <laughs> yeah. but I am going to go. <laughs> <laughs> So it was kind of like that. And it took a while for my family to get on board. My dad, you know, of course, he was fine. I was like, whatever you do, you know, I love you no matter what. My mom's like, I love you no matter what. But how about a lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> Lawyers um, make money. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, not, not really. <laughs> not always. <laughs> Sorry. Not no, always. It's true. It's true. <laughs> yeah. It's so uh, yeah. So in my head, it was, it was kind of like the task to follow to do all the things that I wanted, including research and learning for life and, and all these things. And yeah. so off I went. Wow. And how did you pick this grad school to go to? Like, how did you know how, what program was going to be good for you? Well, again, <laughs> the same criteria the as before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It was, it was a little bit of that. It was also, I, I've always not only relied on my gut feeling, but I do have strong gut feelings. Mm-hmm. And so I, I do try to listen to them. And I think as I've gotten older, I'm better at listening (laughs) to them. And so when I, when it was a time for the year now, okay. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do grad school. And then the question was like, what do I do if I want a PhD? It's going to be this many years. And in my head, I saw things very prescribed as you have to wait to do this and then you do that. So in my head, it was like, go get the PhD. Then you maybe can get married. Then maybe you can have children. Right. And I was like, that's going to be so long. And I was like, I, I, and I'm already old. I was like, no. <laughs> and, you know, of course, my husband now at the time, he was boyfriend. He's like, why do we have to wait? Why don't we just do it at the same time? And I'm like, I don't he was, know. That's just not... <laughs> wait, he's not an academic, right? <laughs> Like, no, no, no. <laughs> exactly. No. Um, and so, you know, with that, I was like, okay, let's just. Do it. So I went from figuring out I'm going to grad school and figuring out what could fit with what I wanted of life, whether a master's mm-hmm. or a PhD. And then I went PhD. Okay, now that is PhD. It's not going to be on the West Coast because that's too far for family. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's going to have to be on, on the East Coast. I did find someone who I really wanted to work with on the West Coast. And that was hard because I was like, oh, this, and it was a woman. I had never worked with a woman. Mm -hmm. Like she was a unicorn to me and she was actually good at making it. And I was like, I need, I need to be with her. But she's in California. So I ended up saying, okay, let's just, let's apply to just a few places Mm -hmm. where I know they can do and help me do what I want to do in terms of the research. And then let's make sure that at least I have some options on the East Coast so I can be close to family and then visit if if you can. And so I visited one where I ended up going, Brown University. And I, as soon as I got close to the building, I had this gut feeling and this memories of Peru in a way that it felt home. Wow. And I was like, I have to get in (laughs) because I'm not going anywhere else. (laughs) If I don't get in, I'm done. And luckily I got it. And so, you know, that was it. That's amazing. I love that. Like you've said, the the decision-making process has been very consistent for you. Like, you know, in terms (laughs) of like a value-based, right? Like I have some criteria. It starts with family and then also life. And I love the idea of like making these big decisions about your academic life based on like something that's core that you're like, here's the things I can tolerate. And here's the things that are out of the question, you know, like moving this far away. No, just like helps. I don't think that a lot of people make decisions like that. 
I think, I think that that's like actually yeah. like something that we could take from this conversation, which is like really thinking about like, well, what are the criteria? What's the criteria for decision-making, you know? And that probably, I don't know, has that helped you to kind of keep your academic life from bowling you over? Or did you struggle in the PhD to like, quote unquote, balance or manage is the word I like better, the family and the studying? Yeah, I, I did struggle quite a bit because I the way I was inserted into the this system, this environment, I had to work three jobs to yeah. pay for the things that I needed and help my family and go to school. So by the time I got to grad school, to me, I was in that pattern of working 24-7, not for academia, but because you have to have two, three jobs and right. do these things. And so it was no different. And so the first year you get there and you know, everybody's working 24 seven. I'm like, okay, fine. That, those are the rules. Just, right. you know? And so I was engaged, but not my, my fiance wasn't there. So it was easier to just be at mm. the department. It was my first time living away from home. So I was like, yeah, <laughs> like <laughs> oh, in another state. Oh my God. You know? <laughs> so I was hanging out with my friends and studying and working. I was like having the life. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But that meant I was there 24-7 and, you know, you don't notice until then, you know, next year we got married and, you know, my then husband or now husband, I guess, joined us in Rhode Island and he's like at home and I'm like, I'm still wanting to be in the department and do all those things. And I'm like, oh, oh, now I have to be with another person. (laughs) Right, right. Think about the person. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that was a transition. And it had to be intentional. Like we had to, I'm, I'm a schedules person. I'm a structures mm-hmm. person. So I had to fit all my schedule. This day is the one day that nobody touches. I don't care if things, flames are going in the lab. Somebody else is going to take care of that. <laughs> <laughs> I am, it's not my lab anyway. <laughs> like I'm yeah. there, but still. You know. And so I had to use those resources that I had to make sure that I, I went the, the balance route, the harmony between yeah. work and life. And the thing is that, you know, I mostly had white males around me as mentors, as people to go to mm-hmm. who I really admired and I still do. Mm-hmm. And so the way that I saw them balance, the ones that could anyway, right. life and, and work, I really, really liked. And I was like, you know, it's possible. I don't know that I can make it as, you know, as a brown woman, but I think it's possible. They do it. There's mm-hmm. got to be a way. And so I was like, I, okay, that's the goal. Then at some point I got sick. I got diagnosed with my chronic disorder like the year after my husband and we got married with then. So Mm -hmm. like as I was getting my prelims, (laughs) taking my qualified exam. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Diagnosed the same week. (laughs) Lovely. So it was that I think is what really made it so that I had to find the harmony, had to find the balance. Mm -hmm. And it's funny you say that, and, and it is true that it's a pattern where, you know, this, the core values kind of like help with the decision-making at that point. It was like, it was almost like a switch. It was like, now that was the core value. Right, that was right. the thing, grab onto life yeah. <laughs> and, and now how to make it work. And it was hard, like all throughout, even without the, the, the chronic disorder, just going from a student to having a family, that was a hard transition, mm-hmm. how to make it work. What things do I really want? What things can I let go? Then, you know, okay, we're getting settled. We're getting settled. Boom, you get diagnosed with a chronic disorder. Yeah. That meant I got lost. I I lost myself. I, I was like, I didn't know that I could do what I wanted to do and all the dreams that I had could even be possible anymore. So it was an adjustment that took a long time to then get to the point where I could say, okay, now how do I balance it with right. life and work and all that? Right. So... It was hard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, maybe you could talk a little bit more because I know that that one of the things that, like, you know, I'm always talking about this like nebulous culture of academia. But one of the things that's pretty, <laughs> I'm thinking of the the Slow Professor book. We can link it up in the show notes. But one mm-hmm. of the things that they quote in there and that they kind of say is like, well, when you look at the culture of academia, like, you're not supposed to have a body. You know, like you're supposed, they don't say those words, but like you're, you're like, it's supposed to be this like cerebral thing and whatever. So part of where things go off the rails is like when you're pregnant in academia or you're breastfeeding or you're like, Mm -hmm. obviously your body (laughs) is in the picture, which of course it is. Right. But 
So I guess I would just say, like, I want to ask, like, for other people who are trying to manage chronic disorders, which are, and this any bodily thing, right, is kind of shunned in academia, whether it's overtly or like underneath, like, oh, can she really do the job now that she's Mm -hmm. sick? You know, so how did you deal with that, especially in like PhD programs, which even like the ones that are like, rosy and happy and supportive still can be competitive. So how did you deal with that? That's a good question. I'm still dealing with it. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. Yeah. Yeah, in, in, in general, but I feel like the support system that I had was really, really important. Some of the things that they would do to make sure, like from the advisors to make sure that I felt heard and supported and my mm-hmm. peers and even some of the admin or even the, the lab people, like the lab manager. I was lucky that by the time I got diagnosed, I had made a reputation. I had created an idea of how Rocio works, the ethics of my work. And so, mm-hmm. you know, by the time I got sick, my advisor was like, no problem. You can take the whole year off, basically, because all the data that you've already pushed through, I know it's going to be fine. And and he he's very good also, you know, having a life and in, in making sure they had a family. So he understood that there were some things that needed to be taken care of. In this case, it was my health. And he was very supportive. I also had my master's advisor in the same department in the same, you know, cohort. And so he was also very supportive in that sense. So I, I feel like the only reason why I really made it through was because when I first got diagnosed and I was going through the dark times of understanding who I was still, even mm-hmm. though I wasn't the same person, I had my husband, my friends, and my family, like almost like a blanket. Mm-hmm. And even in, at times that I remember going like, I hate the world. And I don't use the word hate. Right. Because <laughs> I don't like it. It brings my juju. But <laughs> I, I remember thinking, I hate the world. Like I hate yeah. like why? Why? Why me? Why this? Why that? And yeah. and I feel like, you know, you don't even you don't have to have a kind of sort of feel this. You you can sure. be in a very dark bad situation in academia in grad school and think, why me? Why did that person have to bully me? Why did that person have to take my idea and steal it and, and leave me like worthless? Yeah. And so I feel like I had that blanket of people who were able to remind me that it was going to be okay. Yeah. That it might, maybe it will take a little bit of work, but it was, it was going to be okay. And then around that blanket, I had this amazing support system. And that includes, of course, my family who were not in Providence or in Rhode Island at the time. But, you know, even then my husband's family and my own family, we, I could feel the love. I could feel the support and, you know, that didn't mean that we had to like call each other all the time, but it was like, you fall, we're here to catch you. Same with my advisors, same with the people around in my lab. And so I feel like that's, that's one of the reasons why I made it through grad mm-hmm. school. <laughs> yeah. And then in terms of how sometimes it's people that can tell you that you're not good enough and can you still do the job if you're sick? Most of the time it was me. It was like, can I, can I still do the job? And and it was from both angles. It was from the imposter syndrome angle, which didn't really help because, you know, even though I've been pretty confident my whole life, over time, grad school chips at you, like chips away. Yep. <laughs> and then with the chronic disorder, it was even worse. Like, can you really? Can you really? How will you? So it was partly the imposter syndrome talking in that sense, but then it was also the project manager. Yeah. How can you? to find the ways to be able to do it. So, Mm -hmm. so I I had to figure out what I really wanted to do, what I really could do. And, you know, in that sense, the decision-making came, what is going to allow me to still have the family that I want to still be the person that I want to be, to be happy and after study because of the new parameters that I have, the new symptoms that could pop in and, and all these limitations. And then how does my career in academia still fit in there? And so that's kind of like how I define that. And once I was defined, you know, I was like, okay, teaching versus research or, you know, admin and this and that. And so once I defined the path in research and that's what I wanted to do, mm-hmm. it was, okay, now how do I make it work? And so listening, I feel like listening to those voices saying, can you do it still? How can you do it? It only helped me find ways to rescue why I wanted to do it and and what I needed to make sure was in place so that I could still do those things. Right, right. So how did you, you got to graduation, right? So you like, what, tell me a little bit about like 
you met, you were in dark times, you figured it out somehow and you wrote the dissertation. So, and graduated. <laughs> so how did you think about that period and then your next steps after that? That was, um, that it, it took a long time, but now that, that I think about it, I almost like went, went by really fast. So mm-hmm. I actually got pregnant, you know, after I got diagnosed, I had like a whole year of let's do this thing after, you know, you figure out who you are and what you want to do. Right. And then I was pregnant <laughs> and then my <laughs> husband was starting a master's in the state where we are now, not where mm-hmm. I was with him before. Wow. And so I was like, okay, I, I need to. I need to do this much work to be able to leave and write the dissertation from home. home. That that Mm -hmm. was my plan. Yeah. And so setting that up, that was like, yeah, it was a relatively short time. Within a year, I was like developing all of the samples that I needed, most of the data that I needed, finishing it up, carrying it with me. I I moved away. So I started working remotely since before writing the dissertation. Mm -hmm. And that was a painful process because I had no clue what I was really doing, even though I thought I did. I was like, oh yeah, yeah. There were some things, major things that I was missing in terms of how to set it up properly so that I could successfully write the dissertation remotely, Mm -hmm. be a mom and learn how to do that (laughs) along the way. Yeah. And it's a thesis and then defend it. So yeah, so it was it was a whole process, but I wrote it basically within months of defending because the year before I was, I thought I was going to go on maternity leave for three months. And my boss was like, you need to take at least three months. And I'm like, no, no, I can do it a month. I just jump in right, right away. He's like, no, Rocio, <laughs> you need at least three months. And I'm like, no, 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 no. And he was right. I needed like a whole yeah. year almost. Yeah. Because my symptoms started spiking up. It was a lot worse because of that. Right. And so a year went by and I felt like I wasn't making progress. And then it was like, okay, I've been in grad school for way too long. We need to set a date. Okay, this date. So we went from setting the date to backtracking what I needed to do. Yeah. And then I wrote the thing in, in a few months. The thing is that I, in this license with the next steps, I we had submitted a grant that was related to my dissertation work the year that I was moving with the kid in the belly and it, it got rejected. So we improved it. We resubmitted it. And so by the time I was defending, we had already heard back and we had the grant. And so I knew what my next steps were going to be. I was going to be working as a postdoc for like three years. Yeah. So I wasn't concerned about looking for a job more. So I was concerned with what would happen after that job Yeah. and how to make that work. Yeah. Yeah. I am like, I'm going to say that I'm impressed with your advisor. Like, I feel happy (laughs) that that you had an advisor who was like truly supportive and truly like, like, because most advisors, unfortunately, or maybe not most, but many advisors would say, how fast can you be back? Like, you know, instead of saying like, oh no, I was he a father. Yeah, he was. He, he has two yeah. children, and and he's been a single dad for a number of years at some point in his life. So he was like, mm-mm, "No, mm-mm, yeah. you're not gonna." That's <laughs> and I great. You know, <laughs> that's good. He knew. That's great. So you had your your next step thing set up. Was it in Rhode Island, like at Brown, that you were doing that? Is that a postdoc? Do you call it a postdoc? Yeah, it was a postdoc. Three years. It was based at Brown. Uh-huh. in Rhode Island, but I was already in Virginia, in Northern Virginia. Yep. And so when we rewrote it, we rewrote it so that it would show that I was going to be in Virginia. I was going to have another advisor at the USGS in Virginia mm-hmm. so that I could have an office, of, you know, if I could or should, <laughs> mm-hmm. and then travel to Rhode Island. So my remote working that started before the dissertation continues through now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you are an expert. (laughs) Now I'm an expert expert. at remote working from a long time ago. Old school remote working. Yes. Wow. I learned the hard way, but (laughs) yes. Wow. And you had another baby in there somewhere. So did that happen during that three year? Yeah, that was during my postdoc. So my first baby was during PhD. Mm-hmm. And my next baby was there, my postdoc, and they were both very different pregnancies. So they both required different changes in my lifestyle based mm-hmm. on the symptoms that they spike, but also just having one plus one kind of like yeah. brings other yeah. other things. So yeah, so that that I'm still adjusting. <laughs> yeah, both, you know, a handful, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So after the the three year postdoc, what happened? 
So basically, as I was working a little bit at the local office here in Virginia, the USDS, I we started trying to develop some collaborations with people at the university where I went to mm-hmm. do my undergrad, George Mason. And I was lucky to finally meet and, and connect with two female scientists, one of them much later in her career, the other one was more of a, an early career. Mm-hmm. And the one who was later in her career, Linda Hinnop, she was amazing a godsend you know she, she's very enthusiastic and that's something that I've always had from the people that I work with mm-hmm. you know, my advisors my master's advisors are always very enthusiastic and so it's you know it's that kind of energy that you want to feed off and yeah. I was like oh I want to I hang out with you more and you're like the first woman that I actually can have close and talk to I was like yeah <laughs> a woman yeah amazing <laughs> so yeah and so with that we started meeting and chatting whenever we could and then we, we kind of like said, okay, you, you have these skills that are like, she's amazing. I was like, you mm-hmm. have all the skills that I want to learn about. And she's like, oh, you you know this thing. And I want to learn about this and you. And I'm like, you're talking to me? Like, I'm little old me. You want me to teach you something? And she's <laughs> like, yeah, you know, you know these things. And I'm like, okay. So we started collaborating in that sense. And she invited me to be at the university and have a desk there, be a, like a visiting scholar of sorts. And so that's kind of like how I entered the university where I'm still at, but now I'm taking a leave because mm-hmm. I'm transitioning. So that's how we started that relationship. And it's a great group. So it was almost like I saw more realistically what I wanted, what I thought I wanted to do from the postdoc years and even mm-hmm. before in a more concrete way, how to make it happen in the place where I wanted, um, because I wanted to be within 45 minutes commute distance of my house, because yeah. we bought a house and, you know, at the house, I want to live in this house forever if I can. I don't know that's possible, but yeah. so I, like, that's a core value. I want my grandchildren to visit. So, oh. so then that university was great. The people were there are great and, you know, they still are. And it's an amazing group. And now it's more like I'm transitioning now because along the way I went from, all white male, I don't belong, but I can make it. Mm-hmm. And I know what I want. So I'm just going to push through. Right. And all along in the back of my head is like, okay, but but who do you look up to? Who can you relate to that you can see yourself? Nobody. Keep pushing, keep pushing. So I'm always like, I've always been able to say, just just keep going. Like you, you got to do what you got to do. Do the hard things. It's fine. Just do it. And then you get the chronic zone and you're like, crap, how do I figure this out? Who can I look up to? Nobody. Okay. All right. Keep pushing. You, you figure it out. Have, use your support system. Use your tools. Just keep going. Keep going. Then finally, I, fi- I find this woman and, you know, this other young early career, Natalie. And, and it's like, okay, now there are women in my life. Yay. Now more and more. And so throughout this whole journey, I was never able to fulfill that need for who do I look up to? Who can I see myself in? And so... Once Geo Latinas came in the picture, it was like, okay, now things feel more complete. <laughs> now this is really home. And so, you know, once Geo Latinas got in the picture a couple of years ago, that basically is what's defining a lot of my next steps. Because now that I, I knew what I was missing and I knew what I wanted and I didn't have, with Geo Latinas, I'm able to say, this is what I can do. This is how I can make it for others to have what I didn't have. With the coaching, it's like, okay, this is how I can make it better for people even outside of Geo and how I can make an impact and help others from all the things that I know and I have learned, but also the things that I've learned from experience. Yeah. And so, you know, my next steps are defined by where do I want my time and efforts to go? You know, I have to be realistic with my chronic disorder. Right. Where do I want my energy? You know, is it my family? How much of that goes to the family? Is it my career? How much goes to the career? And what do I do with that career? Mm-hmm. And so that that's essentially what's defining my next steps. How to how to still, I guess I'm still back to that, those years of university in Peru that I wanted to save the world and change my environment, <laughs> and, you know, my environment, my community, and yeah. you know, how to make it better. Yeah. No, like a hundred percent. Like I don't see anything that Rocio in Peru was thinking as actually far off from what <laughs> Rocio is doing right now. So a couple of things that I want to ask about. Like one is in this summer series of interviews, one of the things that we're kind of talking about or that one of the reasons to do them is to just show this like diversity of paths and to kind of start to break with this idea that there's like a predetermined or predescribed path through academia that looks a certain way. One of the ways it looks is that you don't have kids in the PhD program or, you know, <laughs> like, like there's like rules and stuff like that. So we just want to like highlight the fact that like everybody has a legitimate path. 
So one of the things about that traditional path, quote unquote, is the idea that the goal is the tenure track job. I think that like maybe in geosciences, there's room for a goal being something like working full time at USGS, right? But so for you, like, did you feel like you had to, did you have that kind of end goal in mind of a tenure track job? And then you had to say to yourself, you had to readjust that or what were you like, that wasn't, you didn't really care that much about that, (laughs) you know? (laughs) (laughs) So, so first I, I knew at some point I did like the idea of having a tenure track, particularly in an R1, because then I could do the research I right. wanted to do. Mm-hmm. But then I was like, but where, where is that going to be like geographically? And I right. was like, is, is that going to be in Virginia? Cause that's where family is. Mm-hmm. And if it's not, then why are you even thinking about that? No. Mm-hmm. And why do you really want it? So, so I, I had the idea of the tenure track briefly because I like the idea of the tools that I could gain through that and yeah. the work that I could do through that. And then I was like, okay, but you can do that job in other ways. Yes. So then it became, okay, so how do I, how do I do it? Once I had my chronic disorder, it was more clear what things I didn't want to have. So actually even before the chronic disorder. So I did a fellowship. I got two years of fellowship teaching at the high school level because I wanted, I really, I really enjoy teaching. And so my question was, do I like it enough to maybe say just a teaching position, um, tenure track or not? And and so I experimented with that. You know, I did a little subbing before, then I did a fellowship. And so I, I realized that I really, really liked it, but because of the time that it would take from me and -hmm. potentially my mine. And when I had a family, I thought Mm -hmm. is I'm going to be not as happy because I won't be able to give it all the time that I want. And so I decided, okay, research is a little easier to put the brakes on, even though sometimes you can't, because you have dreams about it. (laughs) You're constantly (laughs) thinking about it, Yeah, (laughs) but I thought it would be a little easier. Um, So that kind of like define, you know, okay, tenure track. Yeah, maybe not really. It was, it was more about the, like what I wanted to do really. So tenure track was only, if, if only briefly in my head mm-hmm. to say it that way. Yeah. So you've mentioned Geo Latinas. Give me like the Genesis story, like of, of Geo Latinas, <laughs> like where, how did it get born? And we'll definitely like link all the information that you want to put in the show notes Yay! about Geo Latinas in there, <laughs> but tell us about like the origin story. <laughs> It was funny. I, you know, through my chronic disorder, I have always felt like I need to refine myself at various stages, you know, and, and it's kind of like a little roller coaster in the ups and downs. And so there are times when you're like, go low and you're like, oh, I don't, I don't recognize myself. So you do a few things to bring yourself back. Yeah. And so in one of those ups and downs and highs and lows, I started getting into Twitter because I wanted to, I don't know, use it as a platform to mm-hmm. complain about things political things <laughs> really that's what I did um not for science I never saw Twitter as like oh a place where you go and meet all their colleagues nah I, to me it was I just want to rant about politics I can't do it on Facebook I'm just gonna do it on Twitter so I got into Twitter and then somehow I connected with like a few people and then some of those connections connected me to other connections and I saw one of those far far connections say something about Geo Latinas, like some organization. Somebody had just created a Twitter account and I was like, oh, who is this somebody? And then I saw someone say, oh yeah, I, I will join. I will help. And I was like, wait, help? I can help. Like whatever. I'll just, you know, and it's Latinas and Geo, sure. So I connected with those two people that I saw tweeting about it. And then, you know, as I got into it, it was like, oh, this is really an organization. Oh, we're really, we can really do something. And so for a little while, I saw it as uh, something that somebody put out there, somebody who somebody wanted to do and I could help. And I was more able because I was feeling like I had more abilities in some ways. And I was like, yes, I I can maybe help and do. And then at some point it became clear that I liked it enough that I wanted to make it something and and have it have something of me as well. And so talking with all of the group of the few people that were involved at the time, then we we decided, okay, these are the next steps. This is what we want to do. And of course, you know, people are busy and it, it took a while to get things rolling. And so finally by... 2019, a couple of us were like, okay, let's just sit down. I like structure. So we define the structure and the roles uh-huh. and the things and the processes, the core ones anyway. And we went with that and we had our first meeting. And then we went from having a handful of people and an email thread involved to having, now we have like over 200 members in like 27 countries and 
over 10,000 followers. And so it became a dream of how do we make sure that we are not the only ones out there? How do we connect with others? How do we inspire each other to continue regardless of whatever path we want to follow? How do we make sure that we validate each other enough to know that whatever we want can be done? And it's Mm -hmm. just a matter of finding how to do it. Because it's hard when you don't have someone who looks like you, feels like you, remotely anything you, you know, it's you. it limits you in many ways. And having this support, this community, Mm -hmm. allows you to dream a little more, allows you to not feel alone. And it's, it's really a beautiful thing. I I've seen it grown. I'm so proud to be part of it. And it's, it's the kind of thing that I know I'm going to tell my grandchildren about, and they're going to be like, Oh, gee, let me do this and that. (laughs) (laughs) So if I'm a Latina sitting at home and I'm like, but I'm in the geosciences, give me the elevator pitch about geo Latinas. Like what is it about for, and what does it do for members? Oh, yeah. So first of all, Geo Latinas is not just for Latinas and Geo. <laughs> you must know uh-huh. that anyone can be part of Geo Latinas. As, as long as you believe in the idea of inspiring, empowering, and supporting Latinas in geoscience, then that's really the whole idea. Um, we're inclusive, so we, we support anyone. You don't have to be in Geo. And the organization itself is all about having a community. So mm-hmm. it's a community where you, it's almost like a little playground. You can, and this is something that my, one of my colleagues, Luisa <laughs> said, it's like a little playground. And, it, and she's right. It, you can get in there and use the place to create anything you want and lead. And that's, that's one of the things that I'd like to push a lot for becoming leaders and learning how to be leaders mm-hmm. through this community. And so as a member, if you want to join again, not, not mm-hmm. a Latina necessarily, but when you do join, you have the option of just being there in the community, being part of it, participating of whatever we offer, meetings, activities, or leading some yourself, testing out the waters on how to set up these activities, these, these initiatives, these big things or little things, whatever you want yeah. to do. So it, it's a place to really grow and get uncomfortable with the learning, but also know that you're never going to fall like down because mm-hmm. you have people who are there as your net. So yeah. 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 That's wonderful. What is. It's so <laughs> exciting. So you're in a little bit of a transition period right now. And part of that is your desire to grow Geo Latinas or to pay attention, you know, to give energy and to Geo Latinas. So and then of course you've been working with us as a writing coach, which for a year <laughs> for a whole year, which is amazing and <laughs> such a joy, like for not just me, but for our clients as well. Like, I mean, one of the things that I really love that you really developed was this peer review process that we do inside of Amplify and Elevate. And it's just been really wonderful having you as a coach. So like, what is next for you? Do you think? That's a, that's a good question. I, there are two things. I'm still it's not that I'm still defining what is next. It's that I'm still maybe working up the guts to actually do that. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm very secure, like a confident woman in many ways. But I, I know along the way through grad school and through mm-hmm. my chronic disorder, I, I, I've become a little less confident, but I'm still, you know, myself. However, now I know my limitations, physically, emotionally, mentally, because of the chronic disorder mainly and, and all the things. And so... I know what I want in the future. And the question is, how do I make it happen without the fear of not knowing all there is to know, yeah. not knowing when you can potentially take the next step, go outside and walk, drive. I haven't driven in I don't know how many years, <laughs> you know, so <laughs> not my choice. <laughs> uh-huh. So there are some things that in terms of next steps are, are hard if you, if you see that end goal. However, what I like about my path and what I really, really enjoy is that as a coach, I can create and I can take the steps that take me in that direction. And, mm-hmm. and the same with Geo Latinas. And so every time I think of next steps, I know what the next steps are more or less. I know what the end goal is a little more clearly. Mm-hmm. I don't know that I how fast I'll go in that direction. That's yeah. something I'm still defining. But I know that I I can still make headway with the two jobs that I have, you yeah. know, coaching and gelatinas that I love that allow me to go in that direction. So, yeah. yeah. 
I'm no, sure that's I answer that question. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's a great answer. And I think it's a great place to kind of end. So thank you so much for interviewing with me today. We are going to hook up in the show notes, all the Geo Latinas information. And yeah, hey. thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Kathy. <laughs> Thank you for spending your valuable time investing in yourself and your career by listening to this episode. If you'd like to continue the conversation, join the over 13,000 academic women and non-men folks in the I Should Be Writing Facebook group. Just go to facebook.com slash groups slash I Should Be Writing or search for I Should Be Writing inside your Facebook app. See you inside.